Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. Before we begin today's session of the comprehensive news analysis, there is an important announcement. Baiju's Exam Prep IAS is bringing for you the target prelims 2022 crash course specifically designed to cover the entire syllabus of the prelims examination. In this free of cost crash course, we will be covering the entire dynamic as well as the static part of the prelims examination. All that you have to do is download the Baiju's Exam Prep app the course starts on the 5th of April. Every single day, you will be given a test of 25 questions. The very next day, the subject specific faculty will come online and they will discuss each and every question and take all your doubts regarding those questions. This is an entirely free of cost program open to every UPSC aspirant out there. All that you have to do is download the Baiju's exam prep app. Don't forget to do that. It's a 50 day revision program that will go on till the 24th of May 2022. As I said, the entire syllabus of the UPSC prelims examination, including the current affairs part, will be covered in this syllabus through questions. The live discussion and the analysis will be taken by very own Baiju's IES trainers. Also, these videos will be available to you in the recorded version as well on the Baiju's exam prep app in case you are not able to see the live version of this discussion. So download the app today itself. Now let's begin the discussion with the first article that is on the topic of the Supreme Court cautioning the Tamil Nadu government's decision to give 10.5% quota to the Vanya community in the state within the 20% quota for the most backward classes. Now just a reminder to you, the Tamil Nadu government had passed a law called Tamil Nadu Special Reservation Act under which they said that out of the 20% quota given to the most backward classes, 10.5% of it will be reserved for the one year community specifically in education and in public employment. Then 7% was reserved for other 25 most backward classes and the remaining 2.5% was for the 22 other most backward classes. Now, interestingly, do remember the fact that the Madras High Court had earlier already caused this decision of the Tamil Nadu government. Tamil Nadu government, however, appealed in the Supreme Court. And now the Supreme Court also has repeated what the Madras High Court had said. The Supreme Court said that there is no basis of your decision of giving 10.5% special quota to the Vanyar community. The Supreme Court said that while the government has the power to make such subclassification amongst the backward classes also, but all that has to be based on the quantifiable data. So the point that the Supreme Court made was that we are not against the concept of giving reservation to any specific class of people. What we are against is that the government of Tamil Nadu has not conducted any such survey that proves the fact that this particular community requires quota. So in short, there is no quantifiable data to prove that the decision of the government of Tamil Nadu was warranted. And that is why the Supreme Court has caused down this decision of Tamil Nadu. The Supreme Court has said that the state is competent to design subclassification amongst the backward classes. They can decide the quantum of reservation also. But the only problem is that it has to be based on quantifiable data only. The article also tells us that reservation has always been a matter of great debate in the state of Tamil Nadu. In fact, most local Tamil Nadu political parties have always been against the concept of creamy layer rule in the reservation. The creamy layer rule, as you know, means that amongst the OBC community, those people who are financially stronger, those who are well to do, would not get reservation benefits of the OBC reservation that the governments otherwise offer. However, in Tamil Nadu, there is no exclusion of the creamy layer from reservation. In Tamil Nadu, the creamy layer also can apply for these reserved positions. The article here says that for Tamil Nadu political parties, this is the time to change their stand and they must realize that if they really have to focus on the people who most need the benefit of reservation, they have to understand that those from the creamy layer first have to be excluded from the reservation net. Only then we would have enough seats and opportunities for those who need reservation the most. Now, as I said, the Vanyar Kota case is not a new case. It was heard in the Madras High Court also and now it has been heard by the Supreme Court of India also. Now, if you look at the composition of Tamil Nadu society, you will understand why the Vanyar Kota issue has been such a burning topic amongst all the political parties. Now, there are multiple backward communities in the state of Tamil Nadu, including the Thevars, the Gounders, but 
but it is a vineyard community only that is considered as one of the largest and the most consolidated backward communities now when you say consolidated that usually means that they have a collective identity for instance if the vineyard community decides to vote for a single political party it is assumed that most of the people belonging to this community would vote together that is why they are a consolidated community and such kind of consolidated communities are most sought after by the political parties who want their votes in large numbers and that is why the topic of vanya reservation has been picked up by almost every political party in tamil nadu and no one opposes this idea realizing their power the vanya community started a state wide agitation in the mid 1980s and demanded 20% reservation in the state and 20% reservation in the central services however that was never accepted by either the state government or the center government thus this has led to multiple agitations year after year in the state of tamil nadu before finally the dnk government in power decided to give them their reservation among the most backward classes quota now the question of reservation in india is a very very old topic and it has been debated at multiple levels after every few years we have a question on reservation when some states start to offer reservation benefits to the cast of people who they think would be beneficial for their political mileage now the history of reservation in india started in 1950 when provision was made for reservation of seats for scheduled castes and scheduled tribes in the legislature the first backward classes commission that was set up was in 1953 that was called the kaka kalelkar commission of 1953 One of the biggest landmarks in the reservation history of India was in 1963 when the Supreme Court put a limit of 50% on reservation a limit that exists even today the next landmark in India's history of reservation was the reserve was a mandal commission report that was accepted by the government in 1990 leading to widespread protest but it also led to the supreme court upholding the government's decision to implement the recommendation of the mandal commission and giving 27% reservation to the obc candidates across all the services in the recent years the question of reservation has mostly been focused on the states for example in 2010 there were protests by gujjars in rajasthan when they demanded reservation within the state in 2016 the maratha organization started taking out marches demanding quota within the state of maharashtra in 2016 the same kind of protests were seen by the jats community in haryana and now we have the tamil nadu issue that has come up in the supreme court again now whenever you talk about reservation and the supreme court there is a phrase that comes up every single time that is quantifiable data now what exactly is quantifiable data and when is it that the supreme court mentioned this The Supreme Court specifically mentioned the concept of quantifiable data in two cases: Nagraj case of 2006 and the Jarnail Singh case of 2018. Both these cases were regarding whether or not the government is allowed to offer reservation to SCs and STs in promotion as well. The Supreme Court in the Nagraj case said that reservation in promotion for SC and ST community in public employment can be given. however the basis of that reservation should be quantifiable data meaning that if the government wants to give reservation benefit to the sc or st community in promotion they must first prove with the help of data that these communities are not adequately represented at the higher level and that is why the government is offering them reservation benefits so whatever decision the government takes has to be based on quantifiable data however in the jarnail singh case of 2018 the supreme court reversed its judgment of the nagraj case the supreme court said that the state need not produce quantifiable data to prove backwardness of a scheduled caste or scheduled tribe to provide quota and promotion for public employment now if a question is why is it then that the supreme court now in the tamil nadu case has again recommended that we should have a quantifiable data to provide one year reservation that is because the nagraj case and the jarnail singh case are talking about reservation in promotion in public employment while in case of the vanyar community reservation in tamil nadu that is specifically for providing reservation inside the most backward classes so it's a sub classification that means you are giving benefit to one specific community that is why the supreme court has again stressed on the requirement of having a quantifiable data the next article is focusing on the significance of bimstech 
especially after the recently held Colombo summit. Now, the author here says that the fifth summit of BIMSTEC was held virtually in Colombo. And it is very strange because of the fact that the group completes 25th anniversary in June this year. And in all those 25 years, it is only the fifth summit of BIMSTEC that is being held. That also shows how the countries of BIMSTEC have not given it a lot of importance, including India. That is why BIMSTEC has a lot of challenges it is facing if it has to really become a body that is significant in the region. BIMSTEC, for instance, represents about 20% of the world's population, but only 4% of the global GDP. And that is why the nations of BIMSTEC have to pull up their socks and make sure that they are worth their weight in the world community. The recently held Colombo summit of BIMSTEC discussed the Colombo package. Now, Colombo package specifically were multiple points of discussion on which different countries gave their views. First was the BIMSTEC needs to strengthen itself. That is, it needs to redefine its purpose, its organization, its institution and how does it work. Since 2016, there have been a lot more talk about BIMSTEC as compared to the last couple of decades. And that is a good sign that the countries are now realizing that they can be in this group without China and they can still make sure that their decisions have a lot of weight. The second element of the Colombo package was that there is a need to put our focus on lesser number of things. Now, if you look at BIMSTEC and when it was made, it was decided that there will be 14 areas of cooperation. Now, 14 areas of cooperation are too many areas for anyone to focus on. That is why the demand is that our focus as a group should not be on so many matters. Rather, we should narrow it down to let's say seven. And each member nation, because there are seven members of BIMSTEC, each member nation should pick up one sector which they should lead and they will be the one who will be representing the entire group in that particular sector. I'll just show you a table of how these seven sectors can be divided. The third part of the Colombo package was that the nations of BIMSTEC also adopted the Master Plan for Transport Connectivity. Now, this Master Plan for Transport Connectivity officially started in 2018. It was even backed up by the Asian Development Bank. But because of what has happened in the past couple of years with COVID pandemic and all, the nations were not really able to focus on this Master Plan for Transport Connectivity. That also now, again, has to come back to a center of discussion and the nation of BIMSTEC must work towards that as well. Finally, the package includes three new agreements signed by the member states, which are regarding giving each other mutual legal assistance in terms of criminal matters, cooperation, diplomatic issues, etc. Because many of these nations are connected to each other via land border, there is a good chance that a criminal from one country can run to the other country and hide. And that is why there needs to be legal cooperation amongst these nations so that no one can take advantage of moving from one country to the other country. One of the problems why BIMSEC has not been able to realize its potential is that the focus has not been on trade. The nations that are a part of BIMSEC don't really have very strong trade relations with each other. For instance, in 2004, a framework agreement was signed for comprehensive free trade agreement. However, out of the seven constituent agreements that made up the FTA, only two have been adopted. And no nation amongst the seven members of the BIMSTEC have been given a lot of importance to that. There were a lot of talks in the earlier summits about improving coastal shipping, road transport, regional connectivity, energy grid, etc. But none of them have become a reality. The good part from India's point of view is that in the past few years now, since India has realized that it will be very difficult to continue working in the SARC because of presence of Pakistan, India has now started shifting its focus towards BIMSTEC. So much so that India offered additional funding to the Secretariat and also offered to support the Secretary General's proposal to establish eminent people's group for producing a vision document for this entire region. India also has a great opportunity because in 2023, India will host the G20 Leader Summit. Maybe during that summit, India can invite the head of the state of the BIMSTEC nation as well as their special guest so that it is seen that we are leading BIMSTEC to integrate with the entire world, with the big boys of the world. It doesn't get any bigger than G20. So if we can have a representation of BIMSTEC in the G20 summit led by India itself, that would be a great thing to look forward. Last but not the least, the article also suggests in the end 
that bimstick that is the bay of bengal initiative for multi sectoral technical and economic cooperation is too big of a name how can anyone remember this except the upsc aspirants and that is why the author here says that there is a need to change the name and make it something which is much more simpler for example the bay of bengal community he says that this small change should not be neglected the smaller the name the more easy it is for people and for communities around the world to remember and that is also something that we should work upon now as i said the nations discussed that we should focus on only seven major areas of cooperation and every country should be given one sector this is that table so bangladesh will head the trade investment and development sector bhutan will lead the environment and climate change sector india will take up security which also includes counter terrorism transnational crime disaster management and energy as well do focus on this part Myanmar on the other hand will take up agriculture and food security Nepal will focus on people to people contact which includes culture tourism etc Sri Lanka will focus on science technology and innovation while Thailand will focus on the part of connectivity now one of the big reason why India has not been able to make good use of regional grouping such as SARC or BIMSTEC is that in many of these cases India is a largest country in the group and when in a group there is one very large country and the other countries are very small the smaller countries always have a suspicion towards the larger country they always think that the larger country would try to impose its wishes on them and that is why they don't really want to go ahead and make good relationship with them this is where india can take lessons from its own gujral doctrine that you would have read about in international relations now gujral doctrine as the name suggests was given by ik gujral when he was a foreign minister before he became the prime minister of india gujral doctrine in very simple terms is a set of five principles to guide india's relationship with its immediate neighbors the biggest point of gujral doctrine is not asking for reciprocity so the gujral doctrine says that most of the nations in our neighborhood such as bangladesh nepal bhutan maldives sri lanka are so small as compared to india's size and market that if india does them any favor india should not ask for anything in return we should not tell them that i will only do this favor to you if you give me something in return india in fact should adopt the concept of non reciprocity that is that we will help you if you want to help us in some way that is your wish if you don't want to help us that is also fine so india should be more magnanimous india should be much more accommodating that will be in the best interest of the group that is the main point of the gujral doctrine apart from that the gujral doctrine also says that no south asian nation should allow its territory to be used against the interest of any other country no country should interfere in the internal matters of another nation All South Asian countries must respect each other's territorial integrity, and they should settle their disputes with peaceful bilateral negotiations. Keeping these things in mind can go a long way if India has to establish itself as a leader of the BIMSTEC grouping and make sure that this group actually has a voice to be reckoned with at the world stage. The next article takes us back to the problems in our neighboring country of Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka right now is going through the worst economic crisis in its history. an economic crisis that is just getting worse with every single day we have discussed this matter multiple times in the past also but because the situation is getting even worse it makes sense for us to refresh our memory and discuss what exactly is happening in sri lanka now all of you would know that the scale of economic crisis that the sri lankan nation is facing right now is unprecedented so much so that hospitals are canceling their surgeries because there is no power in the hospital newspapers and media houses have shut down because they don't have any ink to print their papers etc people are skipping their meals people are lined up outside the petrol pumps people are lined up just to get water supply all of that is unprecedented because sri lanka is a country remember which has much higher per capita income as compared to india and that is why it is very surprising as to what is happening in sri lanka now if you look at articles in the international media there are multiple reasons that people are pointing towards some people are saying that the overnight decision of the sri lankan president saying that the country will now be 100% organic is the reason behind all this problem in sri lanka some people are pointing towards the covid but the real problem actually started way back in 2019 with the easter bombing issue now if you are not aware of it in april 2019 on easter sunday 
three churches in Sri Lanka and three luxury hotels in Colombo were targeted in a series of blasts by suicide bombings in Sri Lanka. That was a major blow to foreign tourism in Sri Lanka because Sri Lanka's entire economy is dependent on foreign tourism coming in, on foreign exchange coming into the country through tourism. And ever since the Easter bombing episode in 2019, the inflow of foreign tourists into Sri Lanka has declined considerably. And then came the COVID, which made situation even worse. Now, Sri Lankan economy usually used to have foreign exchange by two ways. Number one, tourists coming into Sri Lanka. And secondly, Sri Lankan people going and working in Western nations and sending remittances. Because of COVID and lockdown, the flow of remittances also has dried up. And since 2019, the inflow of tourists has also dried up. Thus, it has been a double whammy for Sri Lanka. So much so that the Sri Lankan rupee has now plummeted to about 300 per dollar, which is nearby an all-time high. The reserves that Sri Lanka has right now are just enough to pay for one month's import. So you can imagine how difficult is the situation in Sri Lanka right now. Because of the lack of supply, the food inflation has hit about 25% in February. Prices of every single commodity that is used in day-to-day -day life, rice, pulses, fish, chicken, vegetable, everything is skyrocketing. And the present situation of Sri Lanka is because of a series of bad decisions that has taken place in Sri Lanka. For example, in 2020, the Sri Lankan president decided to restrict import. Why? Because he wanted to ensure that Sri Lanka has enough foreign exchange and we are producing whatever we need inside our house. By that logic only, he overnight announced that Sri Lanka will now be a 100% organic farming country and he banned the import of chemical fertilizer in May 2021. This was the worst decision taken by the Sri Lankan president in Sri Lanka's history that led to not only cutting down of Sri Lankan food production into almost half, it even forced Sri Lanka to import rice, wheat, etc. And now because they are importing it from other countries, they anyways can't be sure if it is organic food or not. So rather than producing this food in your own country, you are now importing it from outside or you are being forced to import it from outside. And again, you are not sure if it is organic or not. So the entire decision of switching to organic farming overnight was a major disaster in the series of bad decisions taken by the Sri Lankan leadership. Thus, the popularity of the Rajapaksha family that has multiple members in the most powerful cabinet positions is at an all-time low right now. There is a serious threat of food security in Sri Lanka and there are mass protests that are going on in every part of the country. In November 2021, when the farmer groups came out in the form of mass protests, that is when the government rolled back its policy on agrochemical and allowed chemical fertilizers also to be used, but the damage had already been done much before that. Such is the situation that Sri Lanka is importing 3 lakh tons of rice from India, 1 lakh tons of rice from Myanmar, just to control the rice prices. So every country in the neighborhood is trying to step in to help Sri Lanka in one way or the other, obviously expecting something in return. India in total has already extended $2.4 billion of emergency support to Sri Lanka, but the situation in Sri Lanka is not getting any better. In fact, China has also received requests from Colombo for an assistance of $2.5 billion that is still under consideration. That is after... Beijing has already extended $2.8 billion help to Sri Lanka during the pandemic. The number of poor people in Sri Lanka are also at an all-time high. World Bank's recent report said that Sri Lanka's relatively high level of inequality as compared to the pre-pandemic level will grow even worse. Thus, there is no positive sign in sight for Sri Lanka right now with all these decisions going wrong and leading Sri Lanka to where it is right now. Now, allow me to show you what is happening in Sri Lanka and how India is helping Sri Lanka with the help of some photos. So, this is the Twitter account of India's embassy in Sri Lanka. This was a photo posted just yesterday, which says that Sri Lanka is being supplied 6,000 metric tons of fuel from the Indian side. So, the situation between India and Sri Lanka also is very interesting right now. In the past few years, India had been worried that Sri Lanka is falling into the sphere of influence of China. For example, taking Chinese loans, giving the Sri Lankan port on lease to China for 99 years, being increasingly dependent on China for multiple things. All of this was just not going well with India. Now, in this unfortunate crisis of Sri Lanka, India, in fact, sees an opportunity that maybe if we give a helping hand to Sri Lanka right now, that can be a way for India to improve India-Sri Lanka relationship. 
that can be a way for india to pull sri lanka towards itself just as it was earlier away from the clutches of china china also on the other hand is not letting go of this and they are also helping sri lanka in whatever way that they want because they also know that they can't afford to let sri lanka go away from their sphere of influence the second photo here shows you the depreciation of the sri lankan rupee as you can see the sri lankan rupee's value has declined considerably from the beginning of march when it was about 200 sri lankan rupee per dollar to about 300 rupees per dollar that is sri lankan rupee per dollar the value of sri lankan rupee is depreciating at a very very fast pace apart from offering the credit of lines india has also offered 40000 tons of rice to sri lanka in the first major food aid to colombo ever since we started the credit line as well the next photo is from the recently concluded bimstek summit where our external minister sri s jay shankar was in sri lanka and he had conversation with sri lanka's finance minister and also sri lankan president during which the sri lankan president in fact asked for help of another 1 billion dollar line of credit from india a request that is still under consideration so as you can see sri lanka right now wherever they are looking they are just asking for help that is their situation right now they are not concerned with whether the help is coming from india from china from the middle east from us from the world bank they are not concerned with that all that they are concerned with is putting food on the plate of their citizens and that too is becoming a very very hard job for the government of sri lanka these are the articles we wanted to discuss on the hindu newspaper today a couple of practice questions number 1 in bimstek india has a platform to consolidate its standing in the region and offset the influence of china elaborate second quota without data is unfair discuss both these questions have to be answered within 250 words each before i log out just a reminder don't forget to download the byju's exam prep app if you have to avail the free crash course starting on 5th of april which will cover your entire prelim syllabus thank you so much for watching the video bye bye